All right. Hi, everybody. This is A7X Fan Ben, and this is Pirate CSG podcast number 41. And tonight we have an extremely special guest. Thank you so much for coming on, Pirate CSG game designer James Ernest. How are you tonight? Hi. <laughs> I'm doing all right. I'm fighting a cold. I can't decide whether it's about to give up or about to give worse. <laughs> yeah. Oh, darn. Man. Yeah, as Eric says, it. I think he's sick right now, one of the other podcast hosts I deal with. So, yeah. Well, right. I, I guess it's winter outside. I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> super windy here in New York. Um, so hopefully that won't mess with the audio at all or have any background noises. But I know I was I was telling you before we started, I got snowed in for a whole week this month. It was pretty awful. Yeah. I mean, when you're in Seattle, uh, if you can't get out of your driveway, you can't go anywhere. Yeah. Yep. All right. Might as well get to the questions here. We've got some submitted from myself and some from some other community members of the Pirate CSG community at my Pirate site, Pirates with Ben. It's in the forum. There's a thread to ask questions for James Ernest. And uh, so I'll get right into things. So when and how did you get involved with the Pirate CSG project, which, of course, was Pirates of the Spanish Main originally? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forget the dates, but um, it was a Gen Con the year prior to release. So that'd be 2005, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I was on a, a panel about game design with Jordan Weissman and a few other folks. And afterwards, he came up and said, hey, I didn't know you did freelance game design. Let's talk. And I said, of course I do. How else do I get money? <laughs> uh, so so Jordan had the idea for just Blue Sky. Let's do a uh, constructible, uh, he didn't have a name for it, but a game using those polystyrene cards um, that had been popularized by Z Cards. There was That was the importer that was doing it. Um, Z cards had tried to do their own trading card game a couple years prior and it didn't really go anywhere. Uh, but, but Jordan wanted to do originally wanted to do something with the pirates of the Caribbean license. Oh, and, wow. uh, yeah, that, that, that was the original plan. So he just said, let's make a pirate game. Nice. The, um, the, the, the slate was really blank though, aside from that. And so we decided pretty early on whether we wanted to do, unit level or you know ship level whether we wanted the miniatures to be people or ships and obviously that polystyrene makes vehicles much better than it makes people so we decided to make little ships yep that's awesome yeah i was just actually making a thread on my site about how i love the scale of the game because you can have a lot of ships in one game without having to need like a ton of room you don't need a whole room full of space to have like massive battles so yeah and i think that ours were the first polystyrene models that had bent pieces Okay, nice. Yeah, I'm pretty proud of that. Nice. Yeah, I love how the hulls curve. I love how the models yeah. like, they look really great. That's one of the biggest compliments I've seen on the game online is people people use the models even if they don't play pirates. They often use the models for other naval games too, which I think is cool. Yeah, they have they have great toy value. Absolutely. Uh, that's 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 the better part of the game. Yep. I um, I think I think we knew that when we were building it too. That's that's why I really didn't want to make people. Yeah. You know, like I, I think there was something like a like a soccer game or some some polystyrene game that used little paper people that were stuck in flat base stands and they just looked awful. Yeah, that does sound kind of random, awkward kind of to deal with. Yeah. You mentioned Z cards. That's kind of interesting because a lot of people have wondered for years what manufacturer in China uh, manufactured the cards for pirates because um, people want to try to find the dies that were used to like cut the cards and make them and stuff. So that's always been a long, long, I actually, I actually don't know. Like Jordan was the one doing that legwork and going to the factory and making sure, um, that, that they worked. And I don't know where they were making them. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, it is definitely a high tolerance thing though, because obviously if the, if the master plate, if the, if the sheet of paper, excuse me, plastic is too thick or too thin, then all of the, notches are the wrong size nothing fits together yep yeah so the next question was from not from me but what is your collection like of pirate csg if you have it's actually pretty thin um i i got a couple of full sets really early in production but i only worked on the very first set i only wrote the mechanics Mm -hmm. uh whiz kids did development on the first set and then uh mike seliker and i had this this deal with them He, he mike came in sort of late in the project because they decided not to do the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean IP. They just didn't want to spring for it right away. And so they came back to us and said, write us a bunch of characters and a bunch of ships. And I was like, that's not 
what I do. Yeah. I, I wrote Jordan a whole set of funny stuff because that's that's what I do. And he was like, no, 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 no. Do something good. So that's when I hired Mike. But anyway, so Mike and I had this royalty deal with them, which was we could get uh, X amount of, of dollars, not percentages, unfortunately, but X amount of dollars if we wrote an expansion. Or we could get X over three if they wrote it. And we were like, uh, dollars per minute, we're, we'll take the X over three. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so we wound up consulting, but not really doing any development work on, on the later sets. And I think that means that uh, pretty shortly after the game came out, we sort of stopped getting, or at least I stopped getting uh, freebies. All, all my, my later pirates uh, are mostly bought at Gen Con and like the super discount bins when, when they show up there. Nice. Yeah, a few people have talked about getting packs at Gen Con. They're always excited because nowadays you can't really find the game in stores hardly ever. It was at um, Target. Yeah, it's been out of print for years now. Yeah, yeah, since 2008. Um, some people have found a few at Target and at Five Below, but other than that, hardly any since like 2010. So. Yeah, I heard. I heard from Jordan that um, that this game was not just WizKids, but Top's best-selling SKU in Target for for a while. Like it did wow. really well there. That is really awesome to hear. I love that. I just wish it was still there, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. That's what a ton of people want, too. So, All right, the next one... I'll tell so, you something else cool about the way these things yeah. are manufactured. The the dies that make them, and maybe you know this, they don't really cut, they, they break. They punch. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what that means is that there's actually a little bit of an angle to the to the fracture, that it's not a straight cut, that it breaks and it, it's, uh, it's got a bit of a bevel on it. So... If the pieces don't go together one way, you can flip them around sometimes as they do go together the other way. Yeah, I have noticed that on some of them. Yeah, great point. Uh, the next one was somebody was wanting a general overview of how sets were designed and finalized. Although you said you were mostly providing some of the work up front rather than the actual game pieces. So. Right, like I delivered the first set. And, and the funny thing is, like even a- after this thing had, had shipped and, and uh, was, was in the, the public consciousness, uh, Jordan sat down with me and, and sort of tried to school me on how to write a set of trading cards. But um, I was like, okay, but you do understand that your guys changed everything we handed you. So if it's not balanced, it's kind of your problem. Oh, there were, wow. There were, there were two ships in the very first set. Then I held them next to each other and I was like, okay, this one is strictly worse than this one. Why? And and more important, which one was I responsible for and which one did they make? Because we gave them a spreadsheet that evaluated these things so at least you wouldn't like make two things that were just clearly this undercosted. Well, one was overcosted, one was undercosted. And I looked for either one of them and they had both not been in the set that I gave them. So they, they invented both of them, didn't cross reference them, and then they were not balanced. How about that? That's really good to know because that relates to a later question as well because that's one of the biggest complaints people have had about the game and it's one of the reasons people stop playing it actually is because there's a lot of unbalanced pieces like the banshees cry the dark hawk 2 is one of the ships from spanish main that was really good um probably the best ship in the set and yeah there's a lot of underwhelming pieces too kind of like pack filler you could call it where they're overpriced and just not that worth using especially in competitive play so that's really interesting i know, to know. so you and, met- like i mean i can talk uh, abstractly about the process for, for for doing this kind of work it's it's mm-hmm. it's just kind of weird that i didn't i i wasn't that closely involved even with the first set of yeah. balancing the, the final numbers but yeah. i mean obviously the way you do it is you, you have to play everything against everything and you have to think like a power gamer and figure out how the where the game is broken and there aren't a whole lot of moving pieces in this set so it's not really that hard to do it we mike and i balanced them the the first balancing pass was to take a wild ass guess at how to evaluate a ship's miscellaneous abilities and that turns into a number in a spreadsheet and then that all sort of adds up by some you know completely off the wall formula to a a single number value for the ship, and you can kind of rate it against other ships using that value. The formula is always a, a guess. So then you have to take it into the real world and actually play it. And and if there's any special abilities or anything that's sort of, you know, second level, that formula can't possibly capture it. So uh, so it's just a starting point. But that's definitely a, a step in the process. Is we we give a numeric value to everything. So for example you know two ships that had the same abilities would wind up being having the same cost or 
or else they'd, they'd show up as wildly different in that evaluation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, what you said about playtesting. One of the things that Kyle Wolfhull, who was uh, the author of The Pirate Code, he's still in the community, he does a lot of the rules questions and answers. He talked about how some of the later sets, especially the Pirates of the Caribbean set, probably weren't playtested hardly at all because some of the game pieces are so clearly broken and overpowered that, you know, it wouldn't it wouldn't make it past one game of playtesting. So... Right, yeah. and, and so like if if you've done a lot of games like this, if you've done a lot of trading card games, if you've done a lot of miniatures games, you sort of start getting a feel for what's going to work. You still have to test everything, but at least you know what you're looking for. Um, and it, I, I can't speak to the balance of any of those sets. I, I don't really know them that well, but mm-hmm. but I can only assume, like you say, that either they weren't tested well or that just wasn't a priority. I think as a as a gamer, you want you want 35 points to buy 35 points worth of stuff and that's totally cool but as a publisher sometimes you don't care about that and i'm not speaking for any publisher in specific but like in the early days of magic we watched what sets did well and they were the ones with the most wild and crazy stuff in them the ones that were really really well balanced so to speak were kind of boring so like in 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 some ways that game succeeded because of the stuff in it that was out of whack so it's hard to say it could have been better, it could have been worse. It's it's all just a matter of your perspective, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That is a really good point. And I think some of the overpowered and underpowered stuff in Pirate CSG specifically does make the game more interesting. And it certainly established like a meta game where there's a certain, you know, batch of maybe 100 game pieces or less that are used in competitive play. And then you've got hundreds of other ones that are just kind of not, they don't really make the cut. But, right, but but also you could probably do handicapping and stuff and say, look, we know that these pieces are, are kind of under-costed or over-costed, so we're going to balance our results based on that knowledge. When I did Button Men, that's a game with hundreds of characters, and I knew that they couldn't all be possibly evenly fair. You know, yep. There's sort of a rock, paper, scissors thing in that game, but there's also some really big rocks and some really small papers. So, like, when the Button Men online community was really strong, they had win-loss ratings for each character and they based tournament results on did you win with someone easy or someone hard you know i mean it's possible to do that it's a real aftermarket kind of kit bash thing but with a game that's been out of print for 10 years i mean that's what we have to do <laughs> yeah exactly do you still have the formula for like how you came up with ships and crew point costs and stuff like that oh that's... i actually don't know the answer to that question yeah. i've been digging a lot deeper in even much older files because i'm currently doing a, a cheap ass games retrospective book that goes all the way back to 1996. Wow. Um, nice. so, so I, that's where I've been digging right now, but in the middle, there's a gap, uh, with a hard drive crash. And I think that may have been the formulas that I had for pirates. I, I didn't see any discs regarding pirates when I was looking at all the old cheap ass game stuff. So it, it may be lost. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you worked on Spanish main and then they basically kind of didn't really invite you back after that. Is that how it worked? Well, we uninvited ourselves, right? We said yeah. we'll take we'll take the lower ro- royalty rate for doing no work because then we can go do other work, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah, nice. <laughs> uh, did you have any favorite game pieces that you remember from Spanish Main, or any least favorites other than the one that they messed up that they inserted? <laughs> yeah, they they really inserted both of those, so I had no idea what what even the origin point was. But um, I, I I don't remember any individual ships for sure but i just remember uh enjoying the the model making and enjoying the the basic play of the game when i was inventing that game i really didn't like miniatures games that were straight up like kill everything games like i just i'm not into that i don't want to just do a uh um scorched earth game so i that's that's why the game is about capturing treasure and and battle becomes a part of that it becomes a an important part of how you win that game but it's not like Destroying your enemies is not really the whole goal. Yeah. Yeah, I do like that balance, actually. And there's a lot of good house rules you can use to make combat more more of an, of an important factor, too. So at the game's apex, how many people were working on the game, which, of course, would be, you know, 2004 with Spanish Main, but about how many people do you think were involved in the project? Well, at in my end, um, Mike Seliker came in towards the end of the project to do... Uh, some heavy development work, writing all the ships, writing all the backstories and and such like that we turned over. I think they all got scrubbed and rewritten at, at WizKids. Um, there was myself as lead design. There was two or three people who were 
fairly frequent in-house testers, and then we probably had uh, a dozen folks doing uh, external beta. I mean, during during the the alpha, I guess phase when it was in cheapest. And then I know that when it went to WizKids, it got a whole department sort of added onto it. So I couldn't tell you how many people were in there, but I know that there was at least a dozen working on it before it came out. So yeah. nice. That's a guess. Yeah. And then what other designers and artists did you work with? I know about Mike Selinker, but I don't know about the artists. I know some of them are listed on Board Game Geek, but I don't know if you've worked with some of them since then or before that, things like oh, that. Well, I didn't, I, had, I didn't publish it. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't yeah. Yeah, that's all. That's all a question for WizKids. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure Paul Peterson was one of the playtesters in that group, but without, I mean, without looking, I, I'm not even sure. Not even sure they got credited. I got, my credits buried at the back of the rules, so I don't know if they took my playtester list or not. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, it kind of shows how they didn't value playtesting enough. Maybe right from the start, in a way. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> I, I call it what you will, but but uh, but Jordan Weissman's listed as the, the the game designer of Pirates of the Spanish Main, and yep. that's just a publishing thing. That's just how some people roll. Mm -hmm. Did you work on any of the flavor text on the back of the cards, or was that WizKids added? I don't recall. Um, I don't know how much of what Mike and I wrote for that game wound up being used. I, I literally couldn't tell you right now. Yeah, yeah, no, it's all good. Um, do you know how WizKids made the ships in terms of, I mean, you talked about the dyes a little bit, but do you know how they were printed and stamped, like with the lamination and the painting process, things like that, or how they were colored? I think that the ink is just printed right onto the polystyrene, but I don't know for sure. Um, I, I do remember pretty early on in the conversation talking about the printing process and how they were done in strips of five. And so on. We had to figure out with Jordan how many pieces could go in each booster pack, and and he was pretty insistent that you know one booster pack be enough to play a game. Mm -hmm. that, that, that seems legit, I suppose. But um, he he was the one who wanted to put six out of dice in every pack, which I thought was crazy. Like <laughs> that's an easy enough component to find. I've been publishing games for ten years at this point, where I tell people to find their own dice, and people are going to wind up with huge drawers full of this useless little six-sided dice. Yeah, it's tiny. <laughs> it is pretty funny. Somebody actually, a while back, I think it was Dagmore or somebody, somebody was going to make a 10-masted junk ship like from the South China Seas expansion out of the mini dice. They were actually going to collect enough and then glue them together <laughs> oh, to try yeah. to make like, a massive oh, ship out of great. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I have enough for that yet, but if I open some of my unopened packs, I might be able to get to that level. So I remember them asking people on the forum if they had any like mini dice they could part with. So anyway. Um... Wow, I wonder where mine wound up. There's so I probably have an active like play box of this stuff, and there's probably just a huge wallet of micro dice in that box. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I've got a nice little plastic box that opens up, and then it has uh, it's got the little pennants too, the little flags that go on the the main mast of some of the square rigged ships. Yeah, that's that's something that I notice even now. I'm playing a game on my iPhone where the 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 pennants blow in the opposite direction that they should be <laughs> yeah i know that sometimes so annoys me the ship too. is being propelled forward by the wind but the pennants are still like blowing backwards yeah yeah that's been like in a, a long time debate actually surprisingly within the pirates community i how, used to how can it be a debate i know well i used to put them backwards um as a kid because i liked the idea of the ship going forward but then i switched yeah. them all eventually i started switching them all because i was like this is just ridiculous and i don't really want to do this like this anymore so right. i <laughs> it makes no sense so to have them going backwards so it's pretty bizarre maybe if they had you know massive engines or motors but this is age of sail game so none of that right yeah see if the sails weren't using the wind <laughs> that wouldn't make more sense yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> uh, so did you design um pretty much the entire spanish main set then before you kind of gave it over to whiz kids yeah, definitely. We we turned in a, a, a number of cards and, and you know a rarity list and everything like th this is where you plug everything in. Mm -hmm. We we turned in a full set to WizKids and then, like I said, aside from that one little cross check I did, I don't know what percentage of what we turned in wound up in the final product. I I don't really know, uh, but I mean most of it probably did. 
I don't know how much of they re- they rewrote or how much of the mechanics got changed, but not very much. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And then somebody else asks, "What's thought? What thoughts or concepts went behind the development of the ships and crew? So, for example, maybe the theming, the the faction choices, for example, things like that." Well, I think when we did our our navies, they were straight up historical. Yep. Uh, so you know, we had Dutch and English, and I'm trying to think Spanish probably. Um, just just basing their abilities on basically quasi historical you know realities. Who was better at what? And and on the, on the pirate fleet too. So so you know at least from. The very basic standpoint, we, we tried to, to have some reality in there and then build on that. Yeah, I really love that because I'm, I'm one of the people in the camp that loves the historical stuff, so I'm glad to hear that. And um, I know Wolf actually mentioned about the Dutch originally being in the game. He kind of revealed that not too long ago, I don't think. And um, I thought it was really fascinating because a lot of people, myself included, talk about how the Dutch are kind of the faction that should have been in the game but we're taking yeah, out. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, they were the yeah. they were the power back then. That's it's yeah. kind of weird that they're the ones that got knocked out, but that's yeah. just you know, that's marketing again and that's just uh, whether it's right or not, it's it's a it's a marketer saying, "Yes, I know this is the actual truth, but if we go with the truth, no one will get it because there's this modern version of this where, you know, pirates are a thing and, yeah. and <laughs> awesome, which they weren't. Uh, and exactly. so on. Like I, I do graphic design and I, I do stuff that's sort of modernized Victorian. It's not real Sears catalog Victorian stuff because that is ugly and no one would buy it. But it's like our sort of romanticized version of what it ought to look like. Yeah, that is really interesting. I find that fascinating as a concept concept in general with pirates being romanticized when they really shouldn't be. They were just you know criminals at sea essentially. So, and yeah, the Dutch were the power in the 1600s, especially. I would have much liked to see them instead of the Vikings or, or even maybe the Barbary Corsair and some of the other factions that came along in the later sets. So it's too bad. But... Yeah, but those, but those Viking longboats are cool, man. Yeah, they are. I will admit, they did really well with those. <laughs> They're interesting to build, too. They're kind of tough to, tough to construct compared to some of the other ones, but... And yeah, I've kind of tried to make up for the lack of the Dutch with a... I've made like a custom set based on um, history only, historical custom set where I've made a lot of Dutch pieces. So I've kind of tried to make up for that scarcity. Yeah, because they really should be, you know, one of the top four factions pretty much. Yeah, I'm sure we had a Dutch faction in the first turnover. I think it just got erased for time or space or or whatever. Yeah, Wolf said that he thought it was because... Whiz kids didn't think they could differentiate the Dutch as compared to like the Spanish or the French. Like they would be just another historical faction with like good overall capabilities. That's what he was thinking right. at least. Well, I don't know. I don't know what people love to explain, you know, what they did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah whether it's the truth or not. I know, yeah. <laughs> um and then another question was what were the main inspirations for the different expansions? I mean, you just worked on the first one, but was there any debate in your head about what time period to start the game in or were you thinking you know age of piracy age of sail and spanish well so i I mean i love the age of sail i love stuff from the age of sail i build lego pirate ships and i mean like custom lego pirate ships and and so that's a time period that i really like i was never going to stray from that and that was jordan's thing too like he wanted to do originally a pirates of the caribbean uh game so that's that's the setting and uh so like obviously with that center point, you can stray in all kinds of directions with expansions. But but I was certainly definitely going to make a sailing ship game. And I think, you know, in, in retrospect, there's things I would have done differently. I have a new game that I'm working on now, uh, which I hope we can talk about. Um, oh, yeah. Tagway Bay is, like, basically my answer to Spanish Main because I played Spanish Main more recently, I don't know, like five or six years ago, and said, there are things about this I want to do differently. Yep. Yeah, I, I want the Kegway Bay has a lot more about sailing in it. It doesn't, for for instance, have a roll to move. It has wind based movement, yep. and uh, and that's just like cooler. And I put it in front of people who do sailing, and they're like, "Oh yeah, this is this is actually sailing. This is cool." Nice. Yeah, that is one of the main complaints of some of the people that don't like the game quite as much is the lack of actual wind rules. That's something some people have tried to shore up with house rules. There's some decent ones sure. I've tried on. Yeah, I mean, you, you can always have a house rule for the win, but it's better if it's baked in. And, and I think yeah. 
my my complaint is more that roll to move is dumb and less that, that we're missing wind because you're never going to have strict reality in a in a tabletop game of this difficulty right but but you should pick and choose those things you want most and you know i i've done roll to move in lots of games and over you know many many years decided decided that it's a terrible mechanic to give each player a random amount of the thing he absolutely must have to win the game is like rolling how many cards you get to draw at this beginning of Magic the Gathering. It's just dumb, right? Huh. So uh, so I think if you are going to take out Roll to Move and put Wind in, you're, you're just taking the game in a good direction. Mm-hmm. Are you saying they used to have, like, rolling dice to determine, like... No, I'm saying how dumb that would be. Like, I'm, I'm just using oh, that okay, as an yeah. example because it's a game everybody knows. But, oh, okay. of course, you don't do that, right? Yeah. Everyone draws the same number of cards. Yeah. Um, I like that you, you stuck with the historical stuff because that's one thing I'm huge on. And I think one of the one of my theories is that one of the reasons the game declined eventually and went out of print is they kind of they started to lose their historical fan base a bit because in the later sets they started going crazy with the cursed and like supernatural elements and a lot of like kind of kid friendly stuff and kind of wacky ship types. So I'm glad you kept it historical because that's one of the things I really love about the game. So thanks for that. Thanks for starting it on you know the best note possible. Well, cool. Yeah. Um, there, there's plenty in real history to keep you interested for a while. Yeah. I, I kind of I, I can't speak to how they did expansions. I don't really know what thinking they were doing to to try and broaden the the base of cards. But clearly, you get some magical stuff in the Pirates of the Caribbean um, world. Yep. And it's easy to sort of keep keep straying from there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they kind of went off the deep end eventually. Um, but yeah, one of the other questions was, how did they determine what strategies were quote unquote good for a pack? But I guess that kind of goes over. If what we only they had actually done an expansion called Off the Deep End, that would have done great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of like at Ocean's Edge was kind of similar. Exactly. They should have called it Off the Deep End. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man, nice. Um, another question was, what, in your opinion, are the most overpowered ships or strategies? Although since yeah, they no changed idea. It, yeah, since no they idea. changed it, and then you didn't work on the other sets, yeah. Um, there are some really crazy ones out there. Um, and yeah, I think if you, if you played it, kind of the modern meta, if you will, it would be kind of shocking to see how unbalanced some of it was. Like, if you played one of the overpowered fleets against, you know, some of the really slow fleets or something, it would be over in like one or two turns but oh well and then another question was what were some of his ideas that never made it into the game wow i don't know i that's that's uh that's thinking back pretty long and hard i I think we poured everything into that game that we could get into it nice does he recall any sets or plans or potential directions whiz kids had in the works what was the direction they had planned for the game so this one, you know, we kind of know where they went with it. So, yeah, no, not really. I mean, in between saying that they wanted the Pirates of the Caribbean license and and asking us to write the backstory, there was another sort of phase where they said, "Oh, we'll take care of that." And they sort of they, they had a, a a sketch of of a, of a set of characters that they wanted to use. So I was running with that for a while too, but then that didn't happen, and they were just like, "Go ahead and write us a set of cards." <laughs> Interesting. Nice. <laughs> it was it was a weird situation. I mean, a freelancer always has to decide whether he's getting paid enough to do the work. And I was not hired to write backstory, right? So I wound up sort of slicing off a little, little bit of my contract to bring in a, a writer and help me finish the, the project. Because um, otherwise, it wouldn't have got done at all. It's just it's a it's a weird position to be in. Yeah, that is does sound interesting. And then another one, which is a good follow up, because you said Jordan Wiseman was really into the Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, a lot of people have wondered how much the Pirates of the Caribbean, the first film from 2003, directly affected the game, specifically in terms of Davy Jones' Curse and Ocean's Edge, because those two sets had, you know, Davy Jones' Curse had the Flying Dutchman, but it was kind of a kind of a lore Flying Dutchman rather than the movie version. And then they also released the Ocean's Edge set right before the actual Pirates of the Caribbean tie-in set, where they partnered with Disney. But it sounds like from Jordan's influence, it sounds like the Pirates of the Caribbean, the first movie in that series, directly affected the game right from the first set. Yeah, that's fair to say. I mean, that was that was definitely Jordan's starting point um, uh, without eventually deciding to go with that license. They, they did sort of start there. But 
<clears throat> that's only because it was the most powerful pirate movie at the time. Yep. The, the the theme of naval conflict and, and, and pirates is, is much older than that and been pretty strong even without the movie. But yeah, I think that's that's certainly what he came to me with is he said, This is our pitch, let's let's do a, a Pirates of the Caribbean CSG. Yeah. Nice. And then the next question I'll kind of change a little bit. It says, after the Pirates of the Caribbean expansion, which was released in 2007, were there any plans to do another crossover? But um, instead, we could say, um, was Jordan Wiseman interested in working with Disney right from the start to try to get like a partnership right from the start for the first few sets? Well, again, I, I assume that was the original plan. That's what yeah. he told me. But yeah. but but these plans change when the, when the numbers get get big mm -hmm. nice um what were some of the future ideas for special ships because in some of the later sets they release kind of scorpions and switchblades and things like that so before um you left did you know about any ideas from whiz kids to introduce kind of like weird ships with like moving parts and things like that or no no i don't i don't know anything about yeah that. it probably wasn't a thing at that point because those started appearing in some of the 2007 sets and then the next one, do you have any favorite memories of Pirate CSG games and your experience with it? I remember the year that they debuted at Gen Con, they had made um, giant models out of foam core uh, yeah. to play on on the floor at their booth, which was pretty impressive. Like these these things were probably two feet high. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's actually, I think the, the main Wikipedia picture on the Wikipedia page for this game has um, has some of those, and I think some of them are from the Pirates of the Caribbean expansion, actually, so that I'm pretty mm. sure they continued making those afterwards. Yeah, they're, they're cool. I mean, I love playing with giant ships. I don't know if you've seen my Pirate Day videos, but uh, for a couple of times, we've cleared off my living room floor and, and played with Lego ships on the, on the whole floor. Yep. Um, the first time, the first video that we did, and the year before that as well, though we didn't get capture that, um, we played Spanish Main, and then after those two games, we were like, let's. I, I think the first thing I said after after the second year was something about this game isn't clicking, and I know that Wiz Kids changed some stuff about the way the game worked from what I gave them to to what what finally came out, and for example, I think. The, the captain ability gave you like one extra action and in the release version it gave you like a whole extra turn I don't know something was changed about it but Interesting. We, we said let's try playing by the original rules and see if those are any better and they really weren't I mean they were different but they weren't that much better so I said alright let's just clear the decks and make a new game and see if, if I can do this better this time <laughs> yeah interesting yeah the captain ability lets you move I mean, you're, and then you know, you're, you're talking to a designer here, so I'm always looking yeah. for a better way to do it. I'm always dissatisfied with what's out there, or else I wouldn't be making new stuff. Yeah, but no. uh, you know, in this case, we were just like the, we were being frustrated by the the like I said, the roll to move stuff and the the lack of balance in some of the, the basic mechanics of the game. What what I think the captain ability used to let you do was, um, God, I'm just I'm. I'm, I'm I've gone through so many versions of the rules now that I'm a little confused, but mm -hmm. um, it gave you a little bit of a move and a little bit of a shoot, right? Instead of all of a move and all of a shoot, it gave you a little bit of each one. Okay. And, and that's kind of what Cagway Bay does. It says, look, you've got six action points for your whole turn, and you can pour as many as you want into moving and as many as you want into shooting, but you can't do all of both, right? Yeah. Uh, and that, that works pretty well, actually. Nice. Yeah, that is really interesting, and some people have talked about how captains became kind of overpowered because they only cost three points, and they allowed you, yeah, to get a full move action and then combine it with a shoot action afterwards as a free action. So, yeah, right. That is a good so point. what you should be getting is a partial movement and a partial shot. It was like a way yeah. to divide your your um, yeah. your power into two different things. That makes a lot of sense, and that sounds like an interesting house rule to try out. That'll be really interesting. Nice. Well, so I, uh, in preparation for this podcast, I did manage to um, to yep. clean up the current version of Kegway Bay and get it posted at cheapass.com. So if you want to send people there, we, I would love to get some more playtest on this yep. new set of rules. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I have the two tabs up, actually. I've got the, the page on your site, and then I've got the PDF of the rules. So And we can talk about that uh, more at the end, too, without a doubt. 
Um, I actually have a link to your YouTube channel in the description for the podcast because I actually did see one of those Pirate Day videos earlier <laughs> tonight, and it, it looked pretty sweet. So, Yeah, they were pretty fun. I really want to do it again, but the living room is so full. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can vibe with that. I've had to clear out my room to play some huge games of Pirate CSG a few times in the past. It's always an adventure trying to pile stuff up high in like corners of the room so I can clear floor space or ocean space in this case. But yeah, Zarex and I have both built some some custom pirate Lego ships as well. He's especially into Lego. He's probably the at least right now the second biggest fan of the game after myself. So so we we both have. Some I really I should I should post my plans. I have a really sweet um, Lego uh, frigate that's probably about seven or eight inches long. It's just a really nice compact little shape and size for for playing this kind of game on a on a larger tabletop. Nice. Yeah, that sounds really cool. I love that. Um, I need to post a photo of that. If not, the, the I, putting the plans together will be a bit of a bit of work, but I yeah. can do the photo. <laughs> nice. And then you mentioned the, the the huge ships too. Some people have actually made their own custom ones. There's a group in uh, Portland, Oregon, called PDXR, and they've got their own. Oh site. yeah, yeah. I've seen those guys. I go to oh, nice. from every now and then. Those oh, guys that's are awesome. crazy. Yes, yes, they they got started as a group by playing pirates. They had some tournaments and leagues going back, you know, 2009, 10, 11, I believe. And they've actually, they have their own set of huge ships and I actually reached out to one of the members of the group on Facebook, I think last year, and they said they were able to find them um, like in storage or something. So they still got some huge pirate ships as well. So oh, that's nice. fantastic. Well, I'm going to be a game storm this year. I hope I see them down there. Nice. That's awesome. All right. Um... This one we've kind of gone over. What are things he would have changed in hindsight? So obviously the captain ability and them kind of with kids kind of inserting their own you know take on the game. But anything else you would have changed knowing how the game turned out at all? Um, you know I don't know. I think the game we made was was the right answer to the question of the time, and mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean it's the the greatest game. But I I don't know. I don't really think of things in terms of what I should have done differently. But I'm always rewriting games I've made like. The, you, I, going through the old cheap ass catalogs as I've been doing recently, every time I took a game back to press, I tweaked something about it. Some of them, you know, were pretty major changes. Some of them were just were just updates and you know playtest feedback and stuff. But but I'm always just hammering on these things. And what led me to make Catway Bay really was the inability to hammer on Spanish Main sufficient to satisfy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nice. Yeah, that makes sense. And then. Another one, how so, do you get out of it? So yeah, I mean, I, there's there's a million little things I would love to have done differently, like asking for more money. But yeah. <laughs> uh, but you, 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 you just got to keep moving forward. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the game, it's my favorite game of all time by far. I'm like a fanatic of it, so I'm certainly well satisfied with how it turned out, to say the least. Um, well, that's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's just it's been one of my biggest passions in life. It just connects so many things that I love about the Age of Sail and history, and then of course the gaming experience. And I, I just love the scale so much because you can you can have battles with like dozens or even a few hundred ships, and it doesn't take up you know a whole house. You can just use a decent floor space and get a great game in big games in. Um, and then another one. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, we were definitely going for that. We were going for a game that you could play at a big scale, and mm -hmm. because even though you supposedly or should be able to play out of one booster, like you shouldn't want to stop there. Oh no! So we were definitely trying to develop something that that would play fast even at that big scale, and you could fit a lot of ships on the table. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, people. And speaking of the boosters, people go crazy. One of my requests for making YouTube videos about the game is. Uh, people want to see more pack openings. I've already done some pack opening videos. People want more. People want to like. People want to watch me open packs that they don't even own. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. The you you might underestimate the collector nature of the game. There's a lot of people um, that love how collectible it is and go crazy. Some people have spent like multiple thousands of dollars on it. I think one of the collectors has spent six thousand. I think he reported. Um, and then there's this, this... Well, you know all the trading card games, they put that special <laughs> chemical inside the booster pack to make you feel good when you open it. Well, that's an interesting point, because I think it's <laughs> this, I think it's nostalgia, but when I open a Pirate CSG pack, I usually, like, take a whiff of it. <laughs> it's probably not a good idea, <laughs> but I've talked about it, yeah, I've talked about it on the forum briefly, where I, I like the smell of the packs, especially the first few sets. I've noticed the later sets don't smell as good inside the pack. I don't know. 
And the, the well, it's getting away. harder and harder to get original mimeograph ink, so I think that's yeah. one of the ingredients. Okay, interesting, nice. And yeah, somebody warned me that you, I probably shouldn't be doing that, but it's not. It's not. You know, it's not a. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah, it's not a drug problem. One hundred percent pure China poison in those things. Yeah, yeah, it's not like an addiction. It's just kind of a you know a little nostalgic scent from two thousand five or whatever. So it's nice. It kind of it does bring me back. I remember opening a Spanish main pack a few years back, and it was it was pretty sweet. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you definitely need to post more videos of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, maybe. Oh, maybe that's what I'll do next pack opening video. I'll make sure to take a big whiff of it. So, <laughs> uh, excellent. Yeah. Um, so, did you ever want to come back to the game when it was still in production, but after you had left, um, did you ever desire to go back and design another set or anything, or work with Wiz Kids in any way, or no? Um, so WizKids and I talked about a couple of other potential projects after this, and, and nothing ever materialized, but um, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it, being a freelance designer and a publisher at the same time is pretty complicated life. Yep. Yeah, that <laughs> so, makes yeah, sense. No, nothing, else, nothing else came together. Yep, yep. Um, the next batch of questions are kind of more kind of grand, more philosophical questions about pirates. Um, like, where did, it all, where did it all go wrong with pirates? Because I've theorized that, you know, making the game, it, there was a reverse power creep where the game actually got less playable as it went along because ships got slower and things became overcosted. Like, there were a lot more mediocre ships in the later sets uh, as compared to the first five or six. So I think that's one of the reasons. Weird. But yeah, so I'm not sure if you stayed in contact with the game at all into like 2008, 2009 when it was going out of print or if you have any thoughts on No, I didn't follow yeah. it that closely, but yeah. I can tell you that it, you know, anything like this is is it's it is a challenge to continue to develop good content for it. Um, usually the, if you see if you see power creep hang on a second. Yeah. I don't know who this is. <laughs> Maybe it's Mike Selinker. No, it's it's a, it's an unknown number. Yeah. So I'm not gonna bother. Yeah. It's an unknown eight hundred number, whatever. <laughs> um. It's it, usually when you see power creep, it's going the other way. It's making you know more and more powerful stuff that makes the older stuff obsolete. That's a good um, business plan for some miniatures companies, but. It is frustrating for the players, but I can't imagine it getting going the other way. That sounds terrible. I, <laughs> I just I was not I was not really close to that set, or I wasn't really following those expansions closely enough to see that happen. But, but I will say that in general, developing for uh, an expandable universe is is pretty hard to do. Yeah. Um, it takes huge teams and and lots of smart guys to to keep a thing from falling apart. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What you said about and, how and guys, I, I'm trying to use a gender neutral term there. Uh, oh yeah yeah it's all good um that's really interesting though and great point about how power creep is more you know profitable i've seen that in pokemon and Yu Yu a little bit which i don't do anymore but i did as a kid and uh that's a great point it's kind of funny the reverse power creep that's kind of just a death knell for the game because that's just that's just a terrible idea really so i don't really know it's it's weird i think they changed some of the set designers and things like that they changed some of the personnel going to the later sets and it, it kind of showed in the, the game i don't know why they made stuff do you feel mediocre, like but... do you feel like those designers are reacting to like if they feel like their player base is saying the ships are too powerful that they think that rolling out weaker ships is the right answer to that <laughs> or or were those ships just just costed poorly because they did some other cool thing that people thought was cooler than it was like i don't know i don't have any any experience what are your theories yeah i think it's a bit a, a bit of that some of the ships were so good in the early sets like the banshees cry for example is three points four cargo l plus l base move and it's the best ship in the game pretty much without a doubt and it overshadows so many other gold runners and good ships in the game that it's it's kind of comical in a way but almost kind of sad and it should have been you know 10 points it was only three or more than 10 arguably so it was grossly under cost and part of the reason for that is it has a negative ability that says this ship cannot shoot while carrying treasure but it's only a one masted sloop with a 5s cannon which is really inaccurate so you're never going to shoot with the ship anyway so whiz kids used some weird right. they use like negative abilities to severely undercut the costs when you know the negative ability didn't really have any impact on how good the ship was so it's right. really bizarre yeah 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and may, maybe, oh, well. what, yeah, I know, right? Um, maybe what you said is also um, part of it in terms of trying to overcorrect where, you know, Revolution, the third set from 2005, that one was one of the best sets and they, they introduced this concept of events, which I thought was really poorly designed. They're basically under underpriced events where you get to play them and then you get like this dramatic big effect and there's almost no way to counter them. So I think they probably did try to overcorrect a little bit. I think it's a combination of that um, and maybe just well, and Magic, Magic survived overcorrection by making cards obsolete, right? And I don't know, I don't think Wizards did, WizKids did this with the pirate ships, but, you know, when, when there were alpha cards in Magic that were just super too good, they they phased them out yeah. and they could they could they could center their their balance again by saying you know and for better or worse all these cards aren't tournament legal anymore if it's more than two or three years old you know you don't get to play them in all the modern sort of tournament formats they still exist and you can play them at home but you can't bring them to the store and like that's a way to to get your power curve back under control i don't know that most collectible games this one included have the breadth of content or the, the player base to really survive taking stuff out of play. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing I'm kind of glad they never did, but at the same time, you have a good point because the, the early sets definitely dominate in terms of competitive play, with a few exceptions. All the sets have good game pieces, but a high concentration are in the fi first five or six. So if they did do yeah, something, yeah, I think it, you have to be really careful with a with a line like that. And yeah. I, this is all again, I'm I'm talking out of, of my hat here because I don't know with the the Pirates of the Spanish Main line very well. But but generally, when you're developing a expandable line like this, if you draw a line in the sand and say our very first set will always be playable, and so will all the rest, then you're setting yourself for for up for trouble if some of those pieces wind up being overpowered right yeah yeah exactly yeah they kind of they definitely messed it up a bit but oh well and i think if they had done a ban and list i think like because because it has that collectible card game aspect to it too yep. an original card that was not overpowered to begin with can wind up being part of a broken combination six years down the line and if you're going to continue to say that everything is playable and in print then that brokenness suddenly becomes part of the world yeah exactly and i think that did happen at least a little bit um i think it would have been interesting if they did a ban list the only issue i have with that is when you buy you know if you bought packs in 2004 and 5 and then you come to a tournament in 2006 and they say you can't use it that's the type of thing that would turn me off as a player but I do understand in terms of curbing the power creep or the reverse power creep in this case. Right. I mean, um, I, I think we talked about this a little earlier too. But it's it, you can do the, the ban hammer is not the only tool in your box, right? You can change yeah. the costs of things. You can you can try to retrofit it to the okay. point that it plays right. And so it's a question of you know, are you whiz kids? Are you running tournaments? At which point you have remedies A, B, and C, or are you private individuals running? game conventions in which case you would have remedies cd and e you know there's just there's yeah. all kinds of stuff you can do besides just banning yeah yeah exactly yeah house rules are one of my favorite things and there's actually been a little bit of talk recently about making a community rule set where since WizKids isn't making the game and we could just make like an unofficial community rule set that shores up some of the rules issues and um and maybe even adjust some of the point costs. right and that's so. that's kind of like that's kind of the path i was on when i started trying to uh to to reconstitute the the pre whiz kids version of the game then like I, i'm overselling that there weren't a whole lot of differences but but i was like where did this come from and why don't i like it and what can i make better I'm trying to do a, a homebrew uh, version of, of those rules myself and of course i'm too lazy to make to fit to finish that loop so i just said screw it let's start over <laughs> yeah no it's totally understandable though yeah i made a few alternate maybe not rule sets but i've added on to the rules to try to make it more historical in some ways and Xerix and I have started some big projects where we're trying to play um, a virtual version of the game on the Vassal module um, in like a historical map of the Caribbean. And yeah, it's, it's kind of overwhelming just to look at the rules and to try to think of like things you can add that don't break or contradict the existing rules. So sometimes starting over does seem a lot easier. So Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you one thing about uh, my version versus Jordan's version, and that is... 
the numbers that on the cannons got flipped. Okay, yep. So, like, and, and I only know that much because it's been a while since I played it. So you tell me, what does a three cannon do? So you basically have to roll higher than a three to hit, so a four or higher. Right, so if it's a six, it's terrible, and if it's a one, it's, it's great. Okay, with right? the original. Well, a six would hit. If, if With a rank three cannon, four or higher would hit, so you have to roll higher than right, a Right, so if the, you, the cannon can't be a six because you have to roll higher than a six. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, okay. Yeah, my I think in the in the draft that I turned over to WizKids, big numbers were better. Okay, interesting. Huh. And and Jordan's feedback was, but but first rate is better than second rate. Therefore, a one cannon should be better than a two cannon. Yeah, interesting. And that is and that is where it was. Yeah, yeah. One thing that people have talked about as confusing for beginners is that um, they wish that the number on the mast was the number you had to roll, rather than it being higher. So, like with a rank three cannon, they would prefer if a three would hit as well. Like rather than thinking, oh, I have to roll more than that number because it's like slightly more of a mental, you know. Well, well, I'm gonna do you one better because if it was if <laughs> it was my version of that ship, then it, if it said three on it, then you could hit on a one or a two or a three. Yeah, yeah, nice. That makes sense too. Yeah, it's like the numbers leading up to it. That makes sense too. Yep. Interesting. And that uh, makes a four cannon better than a three cannon, which yeah. is what I would expect new players to expect. Yeah, that makes sense too. Yeah, that's an interesting yeah. way of doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, you'd have to remark all your ships to do that. Yeah, no, I was gonna say that would Which, break. That's like, like that's like one of those rules that would be really easy to implement if you didn't have to change all those plastic components. Yeah, yeah, that would totally break like so many pieces. Like HMS Endeavor from Pirates of the Caribbean would suddenly become not so great anymore. <laughs> it's one of the best. Oh right, ships, I mean that's, that's what I'm saying. You have yeah. to you have to replace all those numbers <laughs> with six minus ten. Oh yeah. Yep. Nice. Um, this one again, more of a kind of just a big question, but. What do you think is the biggest reason that Pirate C- CSG went out of print, which was November 2008? I have no idea. I think it was continuing to do well enough. I think that WizKids itself was changing what they were doing and, and who they were. Yep. So I think it's not a, as much a matter of the survival of that one game, but rather the whole company sort of turning inside out. Yep. Interesting. That's good to hear, too. Um because I don't want, so I like don't want pirates to get the blame in a weird way. But one thing I oh, thought and then, about and then the the new Wiz Kids, that is to say, that name was basically bought by an entirely different group of people. Yeah, and those IPs were, in some cases, you know, brought back, and in some cases, let die. That new group didn't have the budget to to do polystyrene cards. There was no way they were going to keep that game in print. So, yep. you know, it it it, it, it was crushed under its own weight, despite being a profitable game. Yeah, yeah. Some people have talked about how they got into contact with some people and they said the styrene method of production was too cost prohibitive to produce. So, yeah. And we see more proof of that because they did actually release a 2012 cards only version of um, Pirates of the Spanish main, but it's, it's, it's like, it's called shuffling the deck, but um, people have not, you know, given it very good reviews. It's kind of, it's just not at all the original game. So people really want the miniature. I I guess I should be pleased that I don't get any money from that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, it's not. (laughs) Yeah, I don't think anyone that's played the collectible, constructible game even enjoyed the little card game. Um, Did you know about that or no? The card game is kind of random, but it came out in 2012, but not to much fanfare, so I wouldn't be surprised if people hadn't heard of it. Well, (laughs) we we keep trying, and of course Jordan's moved on to bigger and better things too, so... Yep, yeah. Um, One thing I... Um, this is just one of my theories about, you know, with the, the Great Recession and stuff. Do you have any opinion on the effect of the 2008 recession and general economics on the game, especially because considering that you were in the games industry when that was going down, mostly in 2008? Well, so I was, but I wasn't really in it at that point. So in okay. 2006, 7, 8, I was putting cheap-ass games into hibernation. And going mm-hmm. and getting a real job. So I was working yep. at Microsoft. Okay, um, nice. When that 2008 collapse happened, I wasn't really in tune with what was going on in gaming, and that's kind of why I don't have a lot of recollection of the end of the the Spanish Main storyline. Is that yep. I was like kind of focused on computer game development at that time. Yeah, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's one thing. One of my theories because um, November 2008 was when some of the financial crisis stuff was getting 
to a peak. So I wonder if that was part of I know. Probably... I was actually, I was in the Microsoft cafeteria uh, the day that that crash was happening and like yeah. everyone was gathered around the TV yeah. going, oh my God, it's the end of the world. And I was, I was one of the three people going, oh, don't worry, it'll be fine. <laughs> of course I was. <laughs> yeah. <wrong. laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, that is one of my theories that the recession hit pirates pretty hard but other games of course survived so it's not not just that it's good to hear what you said about whiz kids you know changing as a company um because i've actually messaged them a few times in the past few years and they haven't really they've kind of just given me the standard kind of canned response saying like we can't say anything about pirate csg or whatever um on facebook but um and they have concentrated more on hero clicks and other things since um you know since 2009 when they were bought by neca so um let's see well i mean so i i have developed cagway bay as not necessarily a a a spanish main killer but definitely a a replacement and i've talked with a couple of publishers who would like to do it they probably don't want to do polystyrene but they might do some other kind of models um I'm, i'm pretty excited about it that happening eventually yeah that sounds really cool yeah i like that a lot <laughs> yeah people the but fans i mean was... in the meantime it's sort of been a perpetual open beta and yeah. and i even shot some video about the game that i really ought to cut together and post and it's been far too long since i shot it but yeah but uh this this spring i'm uh doing a book a collection of all the original black and white cheap ass games in one book and building that Kickstarter campaign and that book product is kind of what I'm doing right now. Over the summer, kind of hoping I'll have more time for products like uh, Kegway Bay and some other sort of skunk work stuff that I'm doing outside of cheap-ass games even. Nice. Yeah, I saw your tweet about that, that black and white book. Yeah. And then I do see the Lego model on the Kegway Bay page. It is, it's tiny but neat. (laughs) It oh, yeah, a... yeah. Um, those are really... That, that's actually the model that I use to, to play test uh, Spanish Main. Oh, wow. That's really yeah. fascinating. Oh, wow. Yeah, I made I made Lego models that were to scale with that game. Uh, the one I was talking about that I should post a picture of is quite a bit bigger than that. It's 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 a much more handsome little vessel. <laughs> yeah, that is really cool to know, though. I'm glad I'm including the link to your Kegway Bay page, because that's, that's a fascinating little piece of trivia that Lego was Well, and the, the funny thing is, Spanish like... like um, um, uh, there's there's uh, the everyone who plays with that ship like before they know anything about else about spanish main they're like oh you could you could take the masts off to simulate damage and i'm like yes you could good thinking <laughs> nice <That's laughs> perfect. when you build your when you build your prototype out of lego that's like the the first thing you think of yep yeah nice I, that's one of the things i love about the game some some people are concerned with fragility of the ships in Spanish Maine. Um, so they put like markers on the mast to mark them as eliminated. But I always take them out. And I found the game to be really durable over time. And only like my super uh, yeah, well used on It depends on the models, right? Like we were talking about before, if the material is the wrong thickness, then you are stressing it pretty badly every time you take it apart. But yeah. Um, yeah, but, couple... yeah, I mean, that's, that's certainly the way we played with Legos and we enjoyed it. Yep. Yeah, a couple of the sets did have some constructability issues, but... For the most part, they fit together pretty well. I'm glad that they're tight because when I've had some loose ships, you know, you turn them upside down, the masts just fall out. So that's actually worse than having a really tight fit. So overall, I think it they, works they really well. They did eventually start rounding those bases, right? Weren't they yeah. originally kind of square and then the later sets have a rounder bottom? Yeah, exactly. The Pirates of the Caribbean set from 07, they started rounding it and they changed the mast yeah. design a little bit too. So, yeah. Um... Do you think the game Pirates CSG has a chance to come back in the future at all? I I don't know. I mean, you're right that this polystyrene production is super expensive. The, yeah. Every one of those uh, dies is ten thousand dollars. Wow. That's you know that's just for the setup, and I don't know how much they're paying to make the minis. But you got to know you're you got to be cranking out a lot of pieces out of that thing before you get your money back. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if there's a company that wants to throw that money at it. Um, I I certainly hope that there is. Uh, as a matter of fact, Mike and I did some work on two other polystyrene games during that period, um, including one that was a really cool set of modular castle pieces. Nice. Basically, I made a a castle construction set that you that started really small but was modular like Legos to the point that you could make bigger and bigger things if you had more and more pieces. Um, and that went nowhere because <laughs> huh. that's how things are. <laughs> yeah, it sounds cool though. I like it. 
<laughs> um, oh yeah, I, I would love to see those things get made. Yeah. Um, do you think it could come back as like a digital game? Because that's kind of what we've talked about on the forums a few times in the past, whether it's like a mobile app game or I play on the Vassal module, which is like a 2D version of the game. You can download the program and play over an online server with anyone in the world. Um, so I've played a, a lot of games on the Vassal module. I don't know if you think it could ever come back as a digital game that was actually, you know, produced by WizKids or another company. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, every format has its own strengths. And so there uh, is this the right me- mechanism for, for that platform? I don't really know. Yeah, I think I think uh, there's plenty of other naval combat games on that platform that are more realistic in in several ways. So I don't I I doubt it. I think this is mostly a tabletop game, and that's where it shines. But yep. But um, it would have to get produced in a non-expensive way. And, and, and as you say, the new WizKids version tried it with cards. I don't know that that's the best answer, but that sounds like the best they could come up with. Yeah, yeah, it's probably yeah the best they could figure out. And some people talk about if the card game sold more, maybe they would um, try the constructible game again. But at the same time, it seems like that would just encourage them to do more with the cards. So I'm not really kind of skeptical of that. But either way, I, I, a lot of people do agree with you with um, what you say about tabletop game. A lot of people say, a lot of people don't play on Vassal, the virtual version, because they, they just miss the magic of like the 3D models and actually you know seeing them on the table and things like that. So I think it could work maybe as a digital game. But like you said, there's a ton of other ones. Like Naval Action is like a beautiful computer game that simulates historical, you know, Age of Sail combat pretty well. So I think there's a lot of barriers to both digital and physical. I just find it interesting to, you know, get people's opinions on that. Um, well, I'm I'm like a shark. I want to keep moving forward. You know, I want to yep. I want to make a new game that's better. Yeah. No, that's the yeah, end. That, I agree with that. Yeah. I just love pirates so much that. Uh, well, I, I hope you get a I hope you get a chance to play Kegway Bay uh, and, and let me know what you think when you when you do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I hope to. Um, let me see. This probably will be tough to answer. Do you know what kind of patent that WizKids had? I don't know if you remember Jordan Wiseman talking about it at all. Like what specific patent? Because I've searched for it to try to find like the legal rights to the game on like the government patent site and things like that. I'm not sure if you know exactly which one it is or, you know, if Jordan ever talked about I that sort of thing. I don't know anything about that. Yep, yeah, be, yeah, no, that's <laughs> there fine. Was actually, yeah. There was a, a Wizards of the Coast WizKids patent lawsuit about this game. Yep. Um, <laughs> and I had for many years thought it was about something, and it turned out it was about something completely different. So I, I don't know a thing about it. Yep. Uh, and and that's where I prefer to be. <laughs> yep. Yeah. No, that's totally fine. Yeah, the legal stuff is just it's tough to even like find information. I I kind of got the, I thought I had found the patent and it said the the rights may expire in like 2022 or something like that, but then it might not or it might not even be the right patent. So it's kind of just a rabbit hole. It's kind of weird, but um, I actually am not aware of any specific patent that WizKids owns. I know that they were in court about a submarine patent that wizards uh filed on a similar game mechanic yeah yeah it's it's a it's an ugly mess yeah yeah because it's also dumb because whatever they thought they had was something that the z cards had already done so shrug huh interesting yeah i'll have to look into the z cards because i don't know much about that one but yeah the wizards of the coast was i think it was over the constructible strategy game name because they eventually changed it to Pirates Pocket Models or Pirates of the Cursed Seas. They actually changed the name of the game because of that lawsuit. So, very interesting. Um, yep, yep, I do not know. Mm-hmm. Have you had any experience with the patents for other games expiring and being open to anyone reproducing the game if the rights expire? Not exactly. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, and then another but, one. But again, I mean, if you're if you're talking about wanting to find a new publisher for the, a game with this mechanic, um, well, first of all, it would be nice to contact the designers for an update. But also, like, I would be very surprised to find it if if there was a patent on the mechanics of Spanish Main. Like, that's just not a thing. It's yeah. really difficult to protect um, game mechanics with a patent, and I think that. You and and so you know, look it up at the patent office and find out what patents actually exist on this. 
I'm not personally aware of any of them, but yeah. that doesn't mean they don't exist. It just means I was out of the loop. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I, sometimes I phrase it, um, wrong because I have found the patent where, or at least more, I think there's more than one where I think it is filed by WizKids. And I think the date is even somewhat accurate, like 2002, 2003. And it's about not so much the pirates game, but in terms of constructing, not so much ships, but it kind of relates to hero clicks and having like constructible game pieces. So I guess they, the rights are more well. To the hero clicks patents very specifically about the hero clicks base and how they do the tracking on it. Yeah. Um, and that's that's a mechanism, and those are easier to patent. Like a game mechanic is an abstract is very hard to protect, but a mechanism like the base on a clicky base figure is is much easier. Okay. And by much easier, I mean still very hard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, this one just random and quick. If Pirate CSG came back, would you want to return to it at all? I would love to work on it. Um, that's if that's what they mean. I, I uh, like I said, if if a publisher wants to to bring it back, they ought to bring it back to me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> see what we can do with it. Yeah, no. I would love to take you know, like I have done many times before, take uh, fifteen years of feedback and and turn it into a better game. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I agree with that, too, because it sounds like you had better ideas than what WizKids, you know, inserted into the Spanish main set. They kind of... Yeah, they kinda I'm going to go with it. different, not better. Because like I said, like when okay. I when we said uh, at, at my house, let's roll this back to the to the pre-WizKids version, we didn't really succeed. Like, we played a different game, but it wasn't necessarily better. Yep. All right. And then, yeah, now, what are you doing nowadays other than Kegway Bay, if you want to talk about your company and things like that? Yeah, definitely. So, so uh, the big project is is April first. We're going to be on Kickstarter with Cheap Ass Games in Black and White, which is the name of our uh, collection book. It's got the rules from a uh, hundred different games, uh, and, and the history of the company. And it's it's a big chunk of work. <laughs> nice. I hope it's easier to read than it was to write. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm busy, you know, copy pasting and finding out how new Acrobat doesn't work like old Acrobat on these old files. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of the major project. Cheap Ass Games is licensing that whole catalog to Greater Than Games uh, in St. Louis, and so we're also in the midst of that transition. And they're going to be doing our publishing for us, which means that James Ernest's future involves a little less publishing and a little more freelance design. And like I said before, sort of Skunkworks projects. I really liked the early days of Cheap Ass Games when I could pump out six games a year because I didn't really have to sell them very hard and they didn't require a lot of production work. Uh, and I kind of miss those days and I have a whole bunch, of course, of backlog games that I want to write now. So I may be doing a lot of print and play, <clears throat> perpetual open beta style uh, games in the next few years. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, that sounds fun. Um, I'm seeing a post about PAX Unplugged, which is interesting. Somebody actually ran a Pirate CSG event at the 2017 packs unplugged where they got a bunch of people to play that i think had cool. never played before so yeah yeah i haven't been to the gaming conventions and events and whatnot but sometime i would like to go to gen con things like that so i have actually found a on ebay i found like a collector's coin from i think it was like 2004 gen con like the year pirates came out because they i think they had like a tournament or something where you could win coins so it's fun to have little things like that from you know official events and whatnot yeah, cool. Um, and then one of the last questions, where can people find you online? I've got some of the links to your site and YouTube channel, <coughs> Instagram, and whatnot, but any other ones you want to mention? Uh, well, let's see. Cheap Ass Games is easy to find on Facebook and Twitter. Um, we're just at Cheap Ass Games on Twitter. I am Cheap Ass James on Twitter, but I probably send about one message every month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, uh, but everything's all gathered together at CheapAss.com. Nice. Yeah, I've got that site up right now. I like how basic and simple it is, too. I've got the Kagway Bay page up right now. So thanks for getting the rules for that out. Hopefully we'll get some feedback from the Pirates community in case anybody has played it or if they want to play it um, yeah, in the I, near I put those the, I put those, scenari <clears throat> excuse me, those scenarios together for a publisher friend of mine a couple of years ago, well, not that long, last year, um, so this version has kind of got all his IP tugged back out of it and some generic names thrown in, but it's it's just two scenarios and they're very basic rules, kind of apologizing throughout that this is still brand new and needs a lot of testing. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that's one I way to, to uh, 
Pirates fans. I got to test it at GameStorm last year and got a lot of good feedback. I'm doing that again this year, and uh, hopefully I'll have it in my in my bag of, of current projects over the summer. Yep. Nice. Yeah, I'm looking at some of the rules, and it does. It already reminds me of um, a Pirate CSG, which I love. There's so many other. Yeah, games. it's got it's got some similarities in in the movement. Uh, you know how you use straight lines and and how you turn the ship. Mm-hmm. I saw that in uh, that Pirates Day video on your YouTube channel, where I saw some some line markers there to move the ships, the Lego ships around. Yep. Nice. Anything else about Keg Bay, Bay you want to mention or no? Uh, I'm sorry, that broke up. Anything else about uh, Kegway Bay you want to mention? I've got the rules up here, but no, the the I mean the very basically the Kegway Bay is almost 100% diceless, nice. which we thought was a, a pretty risky move, but we so far we're really liking it. The only time you roll dice in this game is when you rush. In other words, when you shoot. Um, before everybody else, you have a good chance of, of screwing up. But mm-hmm. if you if you think about classic abstract games, there's no dice rolling in chess, and it's a perfectly good game. A lot of the movement in this sort of becomes a randomizer because you're not allowed to measure where you move, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, and it is an open playground. The, the, the tabletop is the sea. So there's still a little bit of chaos in this, but it's not as crazy <laughs> as, as rolling dice to see how far you get to move. Yeah, and uh, and there the 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 initiative is done based on the wind. Wind tells you how fast your ship is allowed to go in different directions. It's all based on that. T- but the wind is also the initiative counter. The <clears throat> I hope I don't get this backwards, but the move phase goes from the farthest to the closest. So the the ship that is farthest downwind has to move first, and then then all the way up to the ship that's closest to the wind. And then shooting goes the opposite direction, starts at the wind source and then moves out to the one that's furthest away. And in both of these cases, the advantage goes to the, the player who's upwind. Hmm. Interesting. Because you, you definitely want to move after your opponent does so you can intercept him, and you want to shoot before he does so you can sink him. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense with the weather gauge and stuff and the yep. you know historical age of sail. I really like what you said about... And you don't really... I like what you said about lack you don't of really uh, you don't really sink the opponent ship in this. You just disable it. Like you, there's no currently there's no ramming. There's actually a section in there that's like I know you want ramming, but you can't have. It. Uh, <laughs> there's uh, there's no pinning because we just sort of assume that that the real ship is much smaller than the model that represents it, and it's it's really all about um, taking advantage to the wind and crossing the T and getting your opponent into the range of your of your bigger guns. Yep. Yeah. I like what you said about lack of dice, too, because that's one of the things with pirates that can be frustrating when you've got a really good gunship and then you roll a bunch of ones to miss with all your cannons. I don't. Right. Sometimes I don't like the right. randomness there's, of it. The, the, there's sort of a game designer's theory that over time, dice rolls even out, and that's sort of true, but it's really frustrating when they don't. And, and a game that has maybe half a dozen rolls that really matter, that's not enough time even for, for that perceived balancing out to, to happen. So, exactly. so, so yeah, I do a lot of lectures now about how to use randomness and, and how not to use it, and, and it's definitely more frustrating than than it should be. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you on that. Um, I also like that you kept it in open world, like pirates, where there's not, you know, you're not limited on the ocean, because, you know, in real life, you, you've just got the open waterways. That's one of my favorite things about Pirate CSG, is you can just sail wherever <clears> you want and do whatever you want. I like how it's not constrained... In Kegway Bay, the same right. thing. It's not constrained now, by like a hex system. A couple right? of those scenarios, the, the scenarios are constrained by the tabletop just because, let's yeah. be practical here, right? But I mean, the, the core rules say, yes, the ocean is infinite and there's a couple of little islands, but otherwise you're just sailing. Nice. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> All right. Thanks a ton for coming on. That was, was, that was really a fun, fun thing. Like, this obviously draws a lot from Spanish Main, and one of the, my favorite things about Spanish Main is exactly that, is the the, the table surface is the open sea, and so you can have a really big game in a really small package because you don't need to have a board and grid everything out. Yep. Yeah, I, I love that. That's one of my favorite things about Pirates ever. Uh, it's like a game, a, a board game without a board, which is just awesome. So I love the concept. All right. This was really great. Thank you so much for coming on again. It was really fun. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a great, uh, been a great time. Now yep. I'm going to get back to writing up 
descriptions of my 30 print and play games for the Kickstarter campaign. <laughs> nice. Yes. So if there's any, you can ask a question of the day to the audience if you'd like. Um, I'll ask mine real quick, um, which is, have you played Kegway Bay yet? And if you do play it after listening to this podcast, what do you think of it? Um, any feedback for James Ernest on Kegway Bay? How much do you like it? Things like that. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Yep. Awesome. 